good to have you here this morning. It's good that you're here and God's freedom is here as well. Let's join in. Alive, you speak your word, and I have gone into your home. Cause I've seen your light, you bring my world to life. I'm coming after your love. I'm not shaken. race, see you face to face, so let your power overflow. I'm not shaking, I'm not letting go. And everything comes alive in my life as we lift you free to worship.
Hope is buried and dead in the grave. I'll speak your name. Oh, I'll speak your name, Jesus. A song of thanksgiving is my battle cry. With joy as my weapon, I'll stand and defy the lie of the dark with my hands lifted.
human eyes, all we see is a flood that we don't know how to get through. By your spirit, we uphold a staff, just like Moses did, a staff that was marked with every supernatural moment, every family um, milestone, every walk in his life, every moment that you marked for him 
as he upheld his staff to the water and obeyed you. Because I hear you saying that obedience is key today. As he held up his staff, he proclaimed that you were his Lord, that in himself he was not able, that in himself he didn't know the answer, that in himself he didn't have the strength. But when he obeyed and he held up his staff, you did the miraculous. And Jesus, I thank you today that there are many situations in our body today that need a miraculous touch. And I thank you that you're with the Finicum family today. As they're walking through a tragedy that none of us could even try to put words to, Lord. Many others, there's widows and widowers in our midst, Lord Jesus. There's people that have lost infants too soon. There's people, Lord Jesus, that have lost relationships that were important to them. There are things in our lives, Lord Jesus, that sometimes we come and all we can do is sit at your feet just silently. But you're so good to part every sea in front of us, to make a way through the wilderness with that when we look back and time has passed and we have scars instead of wounds, we can say, Jesus, you did that. You were there. You never forsake us. You never leave. You never change. And you're not a man that you should lie. And so, Lord Jesus, today, as we gather in this place, we say, you are the king. We lift up our staffs to you. Every moment, every marking of our lives, we lift it up to you. And we say, Jesus, come and have your way. Come and do your will. Save our family members. Save our neighbors. Help us, Lord Jesus, to have courage to ask people where they're going because life is a vapor and none of us know how long we have, God. So Lord Jesus, I pray today that you will open the eyes of our hearts to see what you want to say. That you would have us in a place today as we hear the word that comes forth that we would be vulnerable in your midst because anything that we hold back from you can't be touched by you. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would work on the heart that's still questioning how real you are, that you would come in love today. Father, because your love brings us to repentance. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can all be here together and each hear something different from you. Exactly right on time and in perfection, what you want to say to us. So we lift up our hands and we sing this chorus to you one more time because gratitude, we're grateful to love and serve and know a God who rescued us, who changed our lives, who made us a new creation and who continue to part red seas in front of us over and over and over and over again. You are good, Lord, and you will never change. And so we thank you for that this morning. And everyone in this congregation says, amen. Let's sing together one more time. I know. 
around us. So if you could greet your neighbor, give him a handshake, a hug, let him know you care.
the movie theaters or something. That was a good sound. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for spreading the love around. I see so many families with kids here today, and it makes my heart so happy. Miss Kathy Bear might need some more help in kids' church, you think? Awesome. Okay, cool. So kids, you are dismissed to have a bunch of fun and learn about Jesus today. Let's give our kids a hand. Who's happy and thankful to have so many amazing little people here? Awesome. Well, welcome, everyone. If you're here for the first or second or even third time and you haven't had a chance to get connected yet, uh, Miss Tisha and Roth, would you guys wave your hands in the air right there? They would love to meet you right here at our welcome table up front after service. And then our ushers also have a welcome card. If you want to just put a, pop a little hand up, we won't embarrass you. We just want to get that in your hand to say hello and welcome and uh, call you during the week and see if there's anything we can pray for you about. There's also a QR code up on the screen. So if you want to just snap that with your phone, you can also um, turn your card in digitally. We're trying to get up with the, what is this, the 21st century? Yeah, 2023. <laughs> awesome. All right, we have a few awesome, amazing things coming up that I want to let you know about. So Sunday, August 13th, so in a couple Sundays from now, we're going to be having an Invite Your Friend to Church Sunday. Who came to know the Lord? Raise your hand if you came to know the Lord because someone invited you to church. Raise your hand. I'm included. Wow, that's pretty low numbers. I was thinking like half the people were going to raise their hand up. That usually happens that way, but okay. So yeah, your ability to invite someone that you know, you don't have to present the whole gospel to them yourself. You can just simply say, hey, I love you, and I would really love for you to meet my church family and bring them with you on a Sunday morning. But I read a statistic this week that about 84% of people start attending church regularly because a friend invites them to church. How powerful is that? 6% of people start coming because a pastor asked them to come to church. So that's, you guys have um, a lot of authority and just awesome, like, ability to invite people. And they listen to you way more than they listen to us. <laughs> so please invite a friend to that. August 13th, Sunday morning, is invite a friend to church day. And then 6 p.m. that night... The men's ministry is going to be hosting a fundraiser for the school. It's going to be a taco feed. Who likes tacos? Me. Okay. Taco feed and game night. It's going to be just a really informal, fun night. We're going to be doing, like, table games, and uh, Thomas probably has all kinds of stuff planned, outdoor games probably, cornhole, stuff like that, and then tacos. So the taco plates um, are going to be sold. The tickets are going to be for sale with Thomas today. Where's Thomas at? Thomas here. I saw Emily. Okay, Gus, Gus is a stand-in man. He's, okay, over there by the back door. Okay, by the main entrance. So we're selling t um, tickets for that today. I'm sure you can also come into the office during the week and grab your tickets. Also, you can purchase them on PayPal because there's a little place that says, what, do you, what are you putting money in PayPal for? You can say taco feed. Okay, there's lots of different ways you can pay for that. But see Gus today um, to get a ticket if you would like to today. And then we're asking that because it's Friends Day, that you pay for a ticket for a friend to come with you. And then it blesses the school because it's a fundraiser, and it also is another fun, informal way to get someone who maybe has never stepped through the doors of a church before to come to church and meet some new people, okay? Thumbs up if you're coming to taco night. It's going to be fun, okay? And then after we meet those people on Friends Sunday and get them to come to taco night, then that Wednesday, which is August 16th, we're going to be having um, a Christian family concert by the Lack family. So they're a traveling family band, and they're coming at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. We're going to be all together as a family. So youth and children and Bible study, everybody's going to come together to enjoy that concert together. So that is also coming up. And then it's not on my list, but I wanted to plug this. Who loves the teenagers of our church? The young people who come Pastor Kobe, under Pastor Kobe's leadership and Brent and Marissa's leadership and all of these amazing young leaders that we have here. 
Well, next week, we're going to do something that we've done in the big church for a long time, but you guys might be new to this. We're going to be having a youth takeover Sunday next Sunday. So youth takeover, they're going to be doing worship. They're going to be preaching the word. They're going to be um, acting in ministry service, in the sound booth, in greeting, all of these things. So our youth are going to be taking over and leading us in worship on Sunday. Who is excited to be here for that? That is July 30th. So, and bring a friend to that too, because that's going to be an amazing Sunday as well. All right, kids tie-dye and paint night, paint bomb night. That's going to be on August 2nd. So Harley is asking that kiddos bring a white shirt and then don't wear something that you're going to be upset if it gets ruined by paint, okay? So wear play clothes that night, August 2nd. And then also the shaking is coming up. If you're not familiar with the shaking, this is something that the Lord put on Pastor Danny's heart in Fruitland that all of the area AG pastors have gotten together. Uh, we meet regularly. We pray for revival. And so the shaking is a service where all of our church congregations come together and we pray together and we intercede for revival in the Treasure Valley. So it's really exciting. People have been coming, um, getting set free, um, getting delivered, getting healed. The, the altar times in that place have been amazing and powerful and the worship as well. So that's going to be at Lighthouse Church, Lighthouse Church in Ontario. And that's also going to be um, Sunday evening, the 30th at 6 p.m. Please check the website for other things that are upcoming. Check your bulletin for women's and men's things coming up. And have an amazing week. I'm done. <laughs> We worship through our giving as well, and we are truly blessed people. God uh, is truly blessing us, and so I would just encourage you that today there's many ways you can give. You can give online, you can give through the passing of the plates, and also there's a box in the back. If the ushers would come. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your home. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would bless our offerings. Let us use this money to do great things for you in this community, to see more people saved, and to see your hand go out. Lord Jesus, bless the gift and the giver this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. And right before the, we do have a video, but right before the video, I just want to tell you a couple of awesome things that are happening uh, this Thursday night when we went canvassing, we were able, uh, we met this young man and we led him to the Lord and um, give the Lord a clap offering for that. Also, uh, uh, when you're just out there, some things just happen like um, you just get touched and we had reached out and we had talked to this lady and um, if she's here, welcome. I didn't see you this morning, but when we were talking to her, she said something that struck my interest. And it was, she felt that there was a curse over her life. And we, we said hi. We, she was unloading her car. And, and we began to go on to the next house. And something inside of me just said, There's, we've got to go back. And she was still outside, and we went back, and we just began to uh, speak life over her, that, that words are powerful, and how we see ourselves is powerful, and, and that, that God wanted to do something. And, and so we began to pray with her and began to come against this curse that was on her life. And I, I really hope that she got freedom in that. And, I, and the reason why I say that, I'm not trying to boast on us or, or boast on those who go out. What I want you to know is that when you are here praying for us and you're giving to this church, this church is actively working in this community. Friday night, we had a rally or a small, whatever we want to, outreach at the park. And, and I saw three awesome people give their testimony. And we saw a lady who stood up and said, you know, I want to have prayer. 
And you don't need, we don't need to know everything that's going on in their lives, but we need to introduce them to a God who cares and loves them. And so what I'm saying to you this morning is that your, your dollars don't just come in and sit, or they don't just come in and pay an electric bill. Some of them do, but they're going out into the community. They're, they're working for God's kingdom. And, and I'm not going to preach my whole message yet right now, but, but I just want you to know that God's doing something in Payette. And he's doing it because of your faithfulness, for your love, and for your joy. And so uh, we do have a small video for you this morning. You know, you can change a lot with just 46 characters. For example, you can change where you live. Or you can change your relationship status. Fellas, we do not recommend proposing via text message. You could also change your career, change your vehicle, or you could change just about anything. But maybe this week, you could use 46 characters to change someone's life. Think about it. Pray about it, and use your 46 characters for a change. Amen. All right. As you know, we've been talking about the parables and miracles of Jesus over the last uh, few weeks, and... Um, it's just been great to dive into the life of Christ and see his interaction with people, the way that he lived his life, uh, the way that he cared for people, and also just the instruction that he gave us as he would knew, know that we were here today at this time. And the Bible is a living, active Thing. It's not just a book to put on a shelf or on a table in your house. It's living and active. And the words of Jesus pierce so just as much today as they have in the past. So if you would turn with me to Matthew 25, it'll be right after what we talked about last week. In fact, some people say it abruptly goes into another conversation that Jesus is having. But it's in Matthew 25, 14. And when you're there, if you'd please stand up with me this morning. Matthew 14 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one. He gave two bags of silver to another and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in portions to their ability. Say with me this morning, their ability. One more time, their ability. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be in your house this morning. I thank you that we can dive into your word and that your word is living, active, and breathing in our lives. Lord, be with each one of us that we would truly get everything out of this today. In Jesus' name, amen. I really believe as we are going, you may be seated. I really believe as we are going through these miracles and parables that we need to look at it like a dish rag that, that is full of water and we begin to wring it out and we digest and we get all that God wants for us in these stories. And some people might look at the Bible and say that it's a pretty big book, but it's a book that is, it, 
if you look at it as your, your compass, as your map, or as the way you live your life, sometimes it can begin to look like a kind of small book. But the Bible is big in so many ways. The Bible speaks to us in so many ways. And through this, as we continue with the parables and the miracles of Jesus, I really believe that God wants to speak to you this morning through this parable. In this series, we've looked at many parables and miracles. Last week, we looked at the, the parable of the foolish bridesmaids. This week, we're looking at the story of the talents. This is the third uh, of three parables that Jesus used to prepare us and prepare his disciples for his return. Um, some people call him the, the, the uh, uh, olive uh, parables because he spoke this around the, the mountain of olives. And, and in Matthew 24, 45 through 50, it talks about two servants. One, were fa one was faithful and one was evil. The faithful servant fulfilled all the responsibilities that was given to him. And when the master returned, he was prepared and rewarded by, uh, by everything that he was put in charge of from the owner. The evil servant thought that he had all the time in the world. And so he began to mistreat the other servants and he began to party and, and, and do things of this world. And when the Master returned unannounced and unexpected. There would be serious consequences for that servant who, who was not ready for the master's return. So if we look at these three parables together, we see that there's just a God is speaking to us and reminding us that he could come back at any time, any hour, and, any time, and everything like that. And, and what I want to say is I'm not trying to give you a date, so put your calendars away. And, and that's not what I'm trying to do. The thing that Jesus was wanting to get a point, his point across was that we need to be ready for his return because ultimately Ultimately, his return is coming. I know in our life, I've heard it all my, my life, and I know that people have spoken it for years, but I just want to reassure you, at some point, Jesus will come, and we will be taken home, and we want to be ready, so we can't feel like we have all the time in the world, and we can just live frivolously and sin as we want to, thinking that we have all the time in the world, and that at some point in our life, we'll just be like, okay, it's time for me to turn this around, because I'm getting older, or I, or I, I might be seeing Jesus soon. We got to know that that, that as the bridesmaids, uh, we have to be ready at any moment with our lamps filled and ready to go when Jesus returns. And as we look at the story today, that we need to take the talents and the abilities that we have been given by the Lord to if further his kingdom and continue to uh, prepare for that which is ahead of us. See, this goes to show that Jesus can come soon and we have to be ready for that. And when we look at the parable of the talents, it starts off with a man going on a trip. And I know that when we begin to go on a trip, we get to plan together. I have four kids, so we pack up the, the car as packed as we can. Marlo looks like this at the back, and she can barely move. Or, and, and if she does move, everything's going to fall on her. But this man was getting ready to go on a trip. And the man in this story is Jesus. The man that is in this story is represented by Jesus. And, and this story, the man calls his servants together. Because one, we know that, that this man is a man of, of wealth. One is because we talked a little bit about it last week. But anyone who had servants in the Bible and anybody that was actually going on a long trip in the Bible must be somebody of means to be able to do these things because they had so much more planning than we do. They did not have Airbnb. They did not have flights. They didn't have anything else. They had to make sure all the camels were watered. They had to make sure they had everything ready for their trip. And he calls his servants together because he wants to make sure that everything in the household continues even though he's leaving. And, Je and Jesus is that man in the story. And the man in the story and is something that we really have to grasp in this story is the man is the one who supplies the servants with the bags of silver. 
See, the man in the story is giving something of himself to his servants and, and, and asking them to take care of something that belongs to him. And when we look at it, when we look at the bags of silver, and in some versions it says talents, and in, in Bible times, talents were not like what we see on the stage on Sunday morning, people playing guitars and, and pianos and singing and, and doing those things. In the Bible times, talents was a weight of measurement. See, a talent in the Bible, it says that the, the menorah in the tabernacle weighed one talent. Um, in Greek, a talent weighed 60 pounds. Um, in the Roman, a talent weighed 70 pounds. And in Babylonian, a talent weighed a little less than 70 pounds. And so we see this as a, 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 a used to measurement. So if you could just picture that somebody was giving each one of these servants a measure of either gold, silver, or some say maybe even copper, that he was not just giving them five talents so that they could form a band and sing in the streets. He wasn't giving them five talents so that they could... Uh, come together and have a quilting club so that they could sell quilts. What he was giving them was the means and, su and supplying them with the means to be able to invest this money in, make something of it while he was gone. And see, also he, he gave them bags based on their characters and their abilities. Their character and their abilities is the measuring mark to which he was giving out the bags of silver. It's a, it, and so what we see here, um, we see that one was given five uh, bags of silver, and another was given two, and another was given one. And so when we look at that, we look at that he was actually in a relationship with his servants. He knew his servants. He knew the relationship, and he knew them enough to know who he should give five to, who should he give two to, and who should he give one. I don't think that this was a determining factor of what, what, uh, what happened in the end, but I believe that it was a measuring mark to which he offered the talents in the beginning of this story. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that a little bit later in point three, but I just want to make sure that you know that it wasn't just uh, an auction or a random choice. It says that these talents were given out because of the person's character and ability. And we, we don't see, even in the sense of handing them out and, and throughout the story even later, we never see animosity between the three servants. We never see uh, one, the servant, uh, we see him interact with the, the master when he comes back, but we don't have any interaction between the three servants. We don't know if the 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 one who had five looked at the guy who had two and said, you know, you're just not as good as me. Or the one who had two and looked at the one and said the same thing or vice versa. He said he didn't use it as an excuse to not uh, to go and invest and and make the make good of the talents that were given to them. And so we see that it was in their character to take what the, sir, the master gave them and he began to use it to improve not only his own life, but the, the master's uh, state and the master's um, uh, property and, and the master's life. But we, you know, it's really important, again, that we understand that all this was the master's to give. The master was the one who gave it. And see, point number two is Jesus will return. And we see in, in Matthew 25, 19 through 20, it says, After a long time their master returned from his trip, and he called to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he entrusted five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise, well, well done, good and faithful servant, and you have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you even more responsibilities. 
Let's celebrate together. The servant who had two received I received two bags of silver, came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. See, Christ's return is inevitable, and it will happen. The servant with five talents and the servant with two talents chose to invest them. And many people will say, well, I'm not into investments, but many people think that maybe they went out and bought a piece of property or they used the master's land and they went out and bought seed and they planted it. Let's just say they put the, the talent that they were given, the talents that they were given to work one way or the other. And it says that he was on a long trip. So what we see here is they were working in, in whatever investment or, or if they were farming, they were farming and they were working. And it says that the, the master was gone a long period of time. And so who knows, maybe they had their ups and downs in their investments. Maybe they had a good year in the crops in one year, and they didn't so much in the next year. What we see is a faithfulness that they had to the master over a long period of time. This wasn't like the master gave them the money, and he drove around the block, and he came back, and he said, what did you do for me? What have you done for me lately? This was a long commitment and a lifestyle that they were living, and I believe that's why it says that they were uh it was based on their character because the the master was giving out these talents or these these uh resources to uh to give them an opportunity to invest them to use them and to enlarge his kingdom investments and in farming there's no guarantees you can have a good year or a bad year i don't think that's what the 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 farmer was, or the, the master was looking for, I think what he was looking for was consistency and work ethic and, and, the, and, uh, and doing their best. And so when we see that this conversation, he was actually praising the fact that they didn't give up, that they didn't stop working, they didn't stop doing something, but they kept trying to uh, continue to invest and use the money that was given them to get more. And it also is very real to us that we do not know the time or the hour of the master's return. So we have to continue to work diligently with what God has given us and be faithful. And we see that uh, at, at, as they were working it, they doubled what they had. They doubled. They, they were given a double portion of what they had. And, and we see that as they began to work and be good stewards, uh, they, they were rewarded when the master returned. And I believe it's no problem when we see that the, um, the master begins to talk to them in the same way. The master who gave... The, or came home, he was no more happier with the guy who had five more than he was with the guy who had two more. And what I'm saying is he was, he was joyful in the sense that he, he began, to, he praised them equally. He praised them uh, in, in honoring that which they had committed to him and to work with what the master had given them. And so it is so important that we Take that which is given to us and invest it in his kingdom. That we begin to use the talents that we have, the, the, the things that God has given us and blessed us with, to begin to reach out and use it for his kingdom and not just for our self-preservation. As see, uh, in 1856, Henry Brown was a slave in Richmond, Virginia. And Henry Brown found himself a box and a small crate, a small wooden crate, and he pokes marked the, the crate to an abolitionist in Philadelphia, which was a free territory at the time. Henry Brown got inside the box and he sealed the box and, and, and he mailed himself to Philadelphia. Henry Brown was, was banking on the U.S. Postal Service to deliver him. He 
He was in slavery and he needed to be delivered. The abolitionist that got the crate, when he opened the box, Henry Brown stood up after being in the box for three weeks and said, How do you do, sir? I'm sure that was a surprise when he opened the box. And, and he said, my name is Henry Brown, and I was a slave. I heard about you being an abolitionist, so I entrusted my future to you. That was the big risk. It was an oxygen risk. It was a risk of being discovered throughout the trip. It was a risk of going hungry. But when Brown, Henry Brown stood up in Philadelphia, he was a free man. Henry Brown rejoiced because the risk was well worth the inconvenience. Living a committed Christian life involves taking risks. It involves having faith that Jesus is going to come through for you. But living a committed Christian life is a risk that is well worth the inconvenience. And we see that as as we look at this story, many of us can tell our testimonies of how we were delivered from a different type of slavery. We were delivered from the slavery of sin. We were delivered from a slavery of maybe a wrong uh, frame of mind, a wrong, uh, even a wrong lifestyle. And I believe even in my own life over the years, um, I was very much involved in sports, and, and I was an only child, and, and, and I, I just believed that, that life was all about a point system. And I believed that, that if, you, if you had enough points, you won. And so many times in my life, I would even equate my relationship with the Lord on the same level. I would begin to say, Lord, I gained some points because I went to church on Sunday. I gained some points because I cleaned my room and made my mom and dad happy. I gained some points because I gave in the offering. So then I would take those points and, and I would live the way I wanted to live when I was outside the church. I began to do things that I knew wasn't pleasing God. And the only reason I know that I knew that they weren't pleasing God is because afterwards I felt more guilty than I felt pleasure in the sin that I was committed. And I want to tell you that God's not in keeping score. He's about freedom. And when I finally got to the point in my life that I was tired of keeping score or trying to, trying to win in my life with Christ, I began to know that I had to give it all to Him. That I had to give everything I was to Him. That there was no right in the line. There was no Oh, do a little bit of good so I can do a little bit of bad. So there was none of that. And, and, and I mean, my sins weren't outrageous, but I dabbed in the world. And because of who I was in the church or, or who I, who I, how I was living as, as a young man, I believe that it gave me the freedom to do those things. And I, I don't know if I was living with one foot in heaven and one foot in hell or how it was all working out. I don't know at what time. I, maybe in August I would have went to heaven. Maybe in September. I would have went to hell. I don't know about that, but I know that God's not about keeping score. He's about having the whole heart. He's about living as, as the king of your life. He's about sitting on the throne. And when we see that, that this man was delivered from slavery, I can believe that when I made my full life and committed to Christ, I was a free and I was free from sin. That I was free to, to live for God. And, and although I wasn't perfect, and I'm not trying to say that I am, but I'm telling you that I began to live and I, be, I began to see God work in my life. And I began to see that which he had placed inside of me become alive. And I believe that that's what these men with the five talents and the two talents had is, is once they were fully committed to the master, they began to see those talents, give them opportunities that they would have never had before and when they took those talents and they used them for the good of the master they were also blessed inside themselves they were also taken care of it doesn't say that I, he hungered for a long time it doesn't say that he had nothing for a long time and when he didn't get his reward until the master came I believe that God wants to bless you today with the talents that he's given you I believe that he wants to see you become the best person for him that you could ever be I believe that he doesn't want 
you to have a point system. He doesn't want you to ride the fence. He doesn't want you to do those things because he's fully invested in you. He's fully invested in these men. He's fully invested when he hands over the talents. He's riding it all on him. He didn't say that he came back halfway through and checked on their on, checked on them and maybe they wished that he had. But he gave it all. He was all in at the beginning. And when we talk to Jesus, we have to understand that Jesus was all in at the beginning. When he gave his life on the cross, he paid it in full. It's no right for us to go back and say, Lord, you owe me now. He's all like, I already did it. I'm good, Lord. You, you owe me a good job or you owe me this or you owe me a good spouse or you owe me this to that. He already paid it all. He already paid it in full. When this master left, he gave it all to them at the beginning. And Jesus has done that for me and you. He's done that so that we can become the person that he wants us to be. He, well, he's done that. He's instilled it in us. And I believe that the, the man with the five talents and the two talents, they understood that. It doesn't say that they might have not have understood that right at the beginning. Like it says, they invested. And many of you know who, are, who have invested, whether, whether whatever it is that you invest in, there's some ups and downs. And like I said, the one thing that I see in the man of the five and the man of the two, uh, and, and this goes for everyone, is that they didn't give up when the tough times got tough. They didn't give up when it was times got hard. They knew that the master was already fully invested in them. And they knew even through the good times and the bad times that that money and the things that he had given him would be sufficient for their needs. And they believed if they kept on going, they would be ready for his return. So this morning, again, are we ready for his return? Also, I believe that the master didn't know that he would have tried harder. Uh, uh, sorry, I got lost in my notes here. There is not always a helpful thing. <laughs> Point number three is the wrong perception. It says in verse uh, 24 through 38, it says, Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I know you were a harsh man, harvesting crops that you didn't plant, gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew I harvested crops I didn't plant. I gathered crops I didn't cultivate. Why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? And at least I could have gotten some interest on it. When we look at the story, there's a very big contrast from the two servants who saw the master returning until the second service is it are, are the last servant the the first two says that they came forward to meet the master because they were looking forward to the master's return and this one it says the servant with the one bag just came and i know it's just one word but there's i believe that there's just a difference of heart when it comes to those who come forward and those who just came See, God was, or Jesus was showing us that it, it, he wasn't looking forward to the master's return because of his perception of who the master was. We see it in his words that he believed that the master harvested crops he didn't plant. He had the wrong perception of him. He wasn't looking for the master's return because honestly he wasn't ready for it. We see that the servant only hid his best, had his own best interests in mind. See, if he truly believed that about the master, wouldn't we ask the question of why didn't he try in the first place instead of just hide the talent or the bags of silver in the ground? If he believed that his master was so ruthless, why did he just hide that which his master had given him? I would think if we had this perception of a master in this situation, that we would try to put our best foot forward so that he wouldn't do something bad to us if he, when he returned. 
at his perception of the master and what he would do to him didn't force him or motivate him to go work for him. It motivated him to hide that which the master had given him. So he was more worried about his own interest than he was worried about the interest of the master. And one thing, too, is he, in this story, doesn't see the same value in himself that the master does. When it says that it was given out to him, depending on their character and their ability, he doesn't see the same character and ability that his master sees in him because he hid the talent. When, he ha when we have the wrong perception of who Christ is, it stunts that which Christ has given us. It doesn't allow us to invest it because we don't believe in a heavenly father who loves us. See, he didn't take the talent that he was given and invest it or try. He hid it because he was scared that he would lose it. Albert Einstein said, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. He says, genius is 1% talent and 90% hard work. See, we see in the response that Jesus gives to the man, it wasn't because of his perception of him. It was almost more because the man was lazy and didn't want to do with anything with that which he was given. In verses 28 through 30, it says, Then he ordered, Take the money from this servant and give it to the one who has ten bags of silver. For those who use well what, is, what are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But those who do nothing, even what they, ha even the little they have, will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so we see that it wasn't that he did. He just feared the master. It was because he did nothing with what the master gave him. He didn't try. He didn't take the opportunity. And when he doesn't try, or when we don't try to be the person that God wants us to be, then when we don't walk in the way that God would want us to, we, we, we don't see value in that which was already given to us. See, we always think that we're not good enough for God, but the problem is, is that we are and he sees the character and your abilities even when you don't. See, this last servant didn't see it to within himself to make a profit from the talent. And I'm, like I'm saying, this talent was, if somebody give you 60 pounds of, of, of silver, or gold, or copper, it's not just like he said, here's a dollar, good luck. It's not that the master didn't give him the means to make it. And we also see that the master didn't hell ask the, the person with two, why didn't you give me five? So the, mas the perception of the master is what held back with the blessing that the man could receive throughout his life. And in fact, through the whole trip, I'm not sure how he was feeling, but he might have felt Felt like at any time the master could return and I'm not sure what he's going to do to me. But it sounds like there was fear. But God's just asking for our best. God's just asking for us to take that which he's instilled in us and begin to live it out. And it doesn't mean that everyone has the same measure of talents. But it does say that even the, bad, even the unfaithful servant got something. So we all have something to give. We all have something. And, and, and the problem is, is sometimes we don't see in ourselves what God sees in us. Even the guy with the two talents. It doesn't say this in the story, but what if he was a five-talent servant? I think there's many people in the church, we've allowed the world or we've allowed circumstances to degrade the talent that Christ has instilled in each one of us. 
Some of us are sitting here thinking that we're a two-talent person when God has instilled five talents inside of us. Many of us might even be sitting here as maybe we think we're a one-talent servant, but God sees a two-talent servant or maybe even a five-talent servant. See, this morning is, I really believe that if we were able to just see in ourselves what God sees in us, that we would be the people that God called us to be. But we've allowed this world to define who we are. We've allowed this world to tell us what we can do and what we can't do. And I'm not telling us to be rogue and go against the laws and this and that, but what did the disciples do? They followed the laws of the Romans until it messed up the laws of Christ. When they asked him not to go out and speak his name, they said, you know what? Sorry, I can't do that. When Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God what is God, they followed the Roman law when when it matched up with the word of God. But when it began to go different, they began to stand up and be the people that God called them to be. And I believe those people are in this room today. I believe that there is talents in this room that are being hid, that maybe maybe we're living for God, maybe we should respect the master, but there's talents that we've gone and hid. Maybe we're a ta- five-talent person, but we've hid two of them in the sand. And it's not because God doesn't believe in you. It's mostly because we don't believe in me. We don't see what God sees when we look in the mirror. We don't see the person that God died for when we look in the mirror. We just see what the world tells us that we are, and it's a lie. The the devil's language is lies. When the devil wants to lie to you and tell you that things of your past have ruined your future, it's not true. Don't listen to those lies. Worship team, if you would come this morning. I believe each one of us, when we stand before Jesus, when the master truly does return for each one of us, we truly want to stand there and hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling these small amounts, so now I will give you more responsibility. Let's celebrate together see when we are in a relationship with christ and we hear the words more responsibility i also want to let you know that that doesn't fall into the world's perspective see more responsibility doesn't always mean more wealth more responsibility doesn't always mean fame or fortune More responsibilities mean that we're living the life that Christ has for us because we're investing the talents that come from him. Not that we're looking at living by the world's standards, but we're living through the master's standards because everything we have comes from him. As Christians, we truly believe that everything we have comes from him. The ability to go to work means that the money comes from Him. The things that we have in our lives come from Him. And when we look at that as what Christ has invested in each one of us, we begin to use those things to build His kingdom and not our kingdom. And we believe that in the end, when we do that, we will celebrate together. How many of you are looking forward to the day that we celebrate together? The time is going to come when Jesus will return. And it will not be about this world. It'll be about his world. And when we celebrate together, it'll be about us dancing around the throne. Not what cars in our driveway. Not how big our house is. It won't take the Bible and put it into the world's standards. Even though more responsibility is given, it doesn't mean our treasures are here on earth. It means our treasures are in heaven. So 
So this morning, are we going to take that which the master is giving each one of us? Because I believe there are many talented people in this room. I believe that God has called us together for such a time as this. I believe when we gather with with Fruitland and New Plymouth that God wants to bring revival. But if all of our talents are hidden, if all of our talents are buried, we will not be ready for the revival that is coming. And I know in this world right now, revival is a big catchphrase. What we want to see is people saved. What we want to see is people that have a relationship with Jesus. We want to believe that Jesus is all that he has said he's to be. We want to see people walking around in pain, healed of their infirmities. We want to see people who have been one way or the other, open themselves up to to the devil's resources delivered. We want to bring freedom, not just a ticket to heaven, not just fire insurance. We want to see people's lives changed. We want to see the kingdom built in Payette for the Lord. And everything we do, he needs to get the glory because I would rather him get the glory and us dance and celebrate with him in the end. Because nothing we can achieve here on earth will even compare to what we'll have when we get to heaven. If you're discouraged, think about heaven. If you're discouraged, think about all the things that God has done in your life. I'll tell you that some people would have be lined up around the corner to laugh as they would walk in this church if they saw me as the pastor. They would have said, never would you ever accomplish this. I grew up in the church, but like I said, I tried to play both sides. Many times as a children's pastor, people would come up to me and say, when are you going to get promoted to a real pastor? But it was in God's timing, not mine. And I believe that we are all here for such a time as this. I believe that each one of us have talents that we are buried, but God wants to use them. I believe that Gus and Amanda giving their testimony and and Jerry giving their testimonies in the park is a talent that God is going to use to bring people to Christ. I believe that our women's Bible studies on Fridays will bring healing to women who are hurting. I believe our men's group on Thursday will bring healing to men who are hurting. I believe that God wants to do something. And it's not all about me. It's not all about them. It's all about us. And it's all about taking what God has given us. When we start to look at ourselves, we get our eyes on the wrong thing. This is not about praising each other. It's about praising God. Trish, I hope your business is amazing because you love God and you put him first. Ra- Raphael and, and, and Gus, I hope your mechanic shop is amazing because you guys put God first. I hope that everybody's dreams come true. When we pray, we pray because we think it'll happen, not because it's just fun or people like to stand up here on the altar. If you came in here hurting, we believe that God can heal you. If you came in here and you need something from God, we believe that he will deliver you. We believe that all the talents, all the stuff, all the bags come from God, and we believe he wants to disperse it. It doesn't say that the master was stingy. It says the master gave to the character and ability. So this morning, I want you to take an inventory. Is your character and ability measuring up to the talents that God has given you? Are you trying to run the fence like I did when it was okay to look at stuff on the internet and try to act like a Christian in church? Is it okay to to say that, God, you can have this part of my life, but you can't have this part? And when is it time for us to give it all to him because it all came from him? God's looking at us to be his children, to be the people he's called us all to be. And the thing is, is he's there ready to give it to us if we're ready to receive it. And when we receive it, we need to use it for the master's praise, for God's praise. It's not all about us. It's all about him. And if you think your talents aren't needed, you've got to be mistaken. This church needs each and every one of you. 
God's going to open your eyes to what it is he's placed inside of you to begin to use you in the way that you never thought was able to. We need mechanics. We need people to full bulletin. We need people in the world to, to, to be an example to who Jesus is. It's not just even about the church. You guys are Christians outside of the church just as much you are inside the church. Let your light shine. When we ask you to invite people, don't just invite, don't invite anyone. Why not walk out of Winco? You don't have to have a long conversation. Hand them a flyer and say, hey, I'd really like to see you there. I know it's probably not all of our cup of tea. Might have to get a little uncomfortable. I don't want to guilt you into it, but Jesus did a lot of uncomfortable things for us too. But I believe there's talent in this room that we don't even understand and we don't even see. But God's looking down and he says, I see the talent in each of you. I believe that God believes in you and he's trying to say, here's your talent. Go use it for what I have instilled in you. Here's yours. Go use it. So this morning, if you would stand. As we open the altars and actually prayer team just go ahead and stay in your seats today this morning I I want to give you an opportunity at these altars to have a conversation with God and ask him to open your eyes to what he sees in you. This world will tell us that we have to be afraid. This world will tell us that we don't know what's going on. There's so many lies out there. I don't know if I said it here last week or that, but you, if you think something crazy, you can find someone on the internet to agree with you. But we know that God's in control. So this morning as we open these altars, I pray that when you come, you'll have a conversation with God and you ask him to open your eyes. Because even though the guy with the one talent buried it and never used it and put it into to no use, it wasn't for the lack of the master giving him the talent. get that? The master saw in him what he didn't see in himself. And I believe sometimes in our lives I've, I've, I've struggled it with, with it myself. I let the world label me stupid and dumb. I've allowed the world to label me many things throughout my life. the labels that we need to listen to are not the world's labels, but God's labels. And he labeled them a good and faithful servant. And each one of you, if you have a relationship with God, you're labeled a child of God. And God don't make junk. He don't. So I don't want to finish, but I think it's time. This morning, worship together with us. If you would like to pray, I just challenge you to allow God to open your eyes to see what he sees. Don't let something else or someone else label you. Let him do it.
waiting for change to come knowing the battles won for you have never failed me yet your promise still stands your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. Still stands. 
The Lord is speaking to us this morning. And I want to be the person that says, yes, Lord. Yes, you're worthy to be praised. Yes, you are enough. Yes, your word is enough. Lord, you are enough. I believe in these last days. Because I do believe the Lord is coming. I don't know when. I don't know how long. But I know I want to be ready. I think he's calling us to not allow the world to define us to not allow us to look at the things that are happening and say, oh, it's not that bad. But he's calling us to be his people. And he's calling us to love him. He's calling us to be the people that he sees us to be. That's all... 
in you. I just really feel it's pressed upon me that that it's there in each one of us. If we allow God to define us and not this world, if his ways are higher than our ways, if we are mindful of his kingdom more than we are mindful of our own. He's not looking, he's not an imitation and he's not looking for an imitation. He loves each one of us and he truly wants to see the best for each one of us. This week, the Finnecom family lost their son. I have four girls at home and I can't even imagine. For those of you who are part of the prayer chain, you were there through each step of the process and even praying that she would make it there in time. So I ask you as a church family to not only reach out as we are going to pray for them in a moment, but I ask throughout this week that you lift up a prayer for them each and every morning. That you reach out at whatever level you're comfortable with to let them know that they are loved and that they are cared for because they need us. There's others who have lost loved ones as well. If you're aware of it, I know sometimes when the shock of the moment hits, we're all there to gather around them. But I ask you, even if you could, put a moment in your phone in a couple of weeks and say, pray for Rebecca or pray for others who have lost someone in this church. That we lift up the family of God. So this morning, if you would with me, reach out your hands. Father God, we lift up this precious family to you. Lord, there's no words that we could say. There's no quick remedy to the pain that is felt. The only thing that can help is the presence of God. So Lord, today, tomorrow, and in the future, I pray you surround this family with your presence. You'll let them feel the love of God. Lord, we lift up this family to you in such a precious way. Father, be with them during this time. Let them feel your love and let them feel your presence. I pray you'll give each one of us wisdom that our words would only bring comfort. That, Lord Jesus, even as the weeks come, that we will continue to reach out and be the family of God that you have placed here. That we will not forget, but we will continue to love each and ever all of us. Others who have lost loved ones in the last few months, we lift them up to you as well. Lord, be with the families, be with their hurt. Lord Jesus, comfort them. Lord Jesus, today we just call upon your angels to surround them. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together this last song. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his 
our praises to you. Lord, I pray a blessing over each person here. I pray that you would go with them each and every day of their week. I pray that their, your presence would be with them wherever they go. Lord, bless them and keep them and keep your hand upon them. And Lord, be with us this week in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. If you need healing or you want prayer, please come up to the front. We'll be praying up here.